Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's Trouble Begins. We are so excited that you're joining us on this very lovely day, at least in Connecticut, it's very lovely. Um, as always, I'm Jody DeBrine. I'm the Director of Collections here at the Mark Twain House and Museum, and uh, your Trouble Begins host for the evening. I'm gonna keep my introductions very short so we can get to the main event, um, but we need to thank our sponsors, um, the Center for Mark Twain Studies at Elmire College in Elmire, New York. They make this uh, help make this program possible for us um, and all you know all year long. Um, most of you have already found the chat. It's on the side of your screen. Um, feel free to talk amongst yourself um, within there. Give John a hard time. You know all of those good things in that chat area. Um, but if you have a question that you'd like us to ask John at the end of the program for the Q and A, there is an Ask a Questions feature down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, put your questions there and we'll try to get to as many as we can at the very end. Um, right above that ask a question is um, a kind of greenish button. Um, it says your support is vital to Mark Twain House Museum. Please donate here. Every single dollar, whether it's $1, $10, $100, all of it helps us. Um, John's pointing to his t-shirt. If you'd like the t-shirt, I'll put a link in the chat to uh, our gift shop. You can buy a t-shirt that supports us as well. Um, every dollar really counts. You know, COVID hit us hard, but we are still here and we're back and better as ever. You can buy tickets to our tours um, and come visit us. And all of that is help support the wonderful things that we do. So our guest tonight is the wonderful John Pascal. Um, and I am, so happy that you're here with us for, I mean, this is the second Trouble Begins that you've done with me. And I know it's, I'm just thrilled and honored to be here with you again. Um, John, you teach at Seton Hall. I know a lot of your students are here and um, we're just so excited to hear about Mark Twain and Thomas Nast. So um, I will turn it over to you and let's enjoy. Thank you very much, Jody. Good evening, everyone, and welcome from all around the country and maybe other parts of the world. It is such an honor to be a part of the Trouble Begins Lecture on behalf of the Mark Twain Home and Museum in Hartford. And that is an honor that must be shared. I do want to thank the McCulloch Hall Historical Museum in Morristown, New Jersey, and I also want to thank the staff of the Morristown and Morris Township Library, North Jersey History and Genealogy Center. Without their help, this lecture would not be possible. I also want to thank the invaluable help of the staff of the Mark Twain Project and Papers at the University of California, Bancroft Library in Berkeley, and also, I want to thank several Overland Express stagecoach drivers, Dr. R. Kent Rasmussen, Dr. Irene Wong, Dr. Alan Cribben, and in particular, Dr. Terry Ogle of Virginia Commonwealth University, who first mentioned Thomas Nast at Elmira, my gosh, four years ago. And I also want to thank my late mother and father who taught me as to friendship, you are judged by the company you keep. And Mark Twain and Thomas Nass certainly kept each other in very unique company. I also want to thank the head of the curatorial collection, Ms. Jody DeBrine, Steve Courtney, Mallory Howard for inviting me back to be here with all of you and for me to share, as I know my students do, our love of Mark Twain and our pride for New Jersey, our garden state. So let's get started. He called himself, quote, the most conspicuous person on the planet, 
unquote. And while he did not, in fact, say, quote, I am not an American, I am the American, unquote, the claim can certainly describe how he lived his life. In his years, Samuel Langhorne Clemens, known to all of us as Mark Twain, resided in all major regions of the United States and spent 13 of his nearly 75 years abroad. He also crossed the Atlantic Ocean 25 times. But for me and my students, he's also a Jersey boy in many ways. 10 or 12 years ago, I was surprised and shocked to receive from England, from the Internal Revenue Office, a tax bill of 48 pounds, an income tax bill levied on my English copyrights. I was shocked, but it was not all shock. I was flattered as well as shocked, flattered to be formally taken notice of by a foreign government. It seemed to kind of introduce me into the family of nations. Seemed, well, it seemed to sort of recognize me as one of the friendly powers. Not on a large scale, of course, not like Russia and China and those, but on a, well, on a secondary scale, New Jersey. And everyone notices that the font color is ink, blueberry ink, because the state fruit for New Jersey is the blueberry. From 1868 to 1907, Mark Twain was in our garden state at least 15 times, appearing in public halls and houses. Scholars of Mark Twain know that he enjoyed a deep and enriching friendship with William Dean Howells, who called him, quote, the Lincoln of our literature, unquote. There is an entire body of documentation on his similar yet still distinct friendship with the Reverend Joseph Twitchell, Civil War chaplain, and pastor of Hartford's Asylum Hill Congregational Church, or Church of the Holy Speculators, as Mark Twain called it, and calling his friend, quote, one of the best men, although a clergyman, unquote. But my focus for all of you is on the singular professional and personal friendship between him and another Jersey boy, Thomas Nast. This would not have been possible without recognizing the unique connections to their biographer, Albert Bigelow Payne. In 2017, Ms. Julia Ward of Virginia Commonwealth University gave a presentation at Elmira College followed by her spring 2018 Mark Twain Journal article, The Pain That Twain Met. And she gave reasons as to why Twain selected Payne to write his biography. Among them are, quote, a dual interest in citizenship and social responsibility, their mutual respect as fellow writers, their dichotomous but complementary dispositions, unquote. And of course, Payne's lifelong admiration for Twain, similar to that of his for Thomas Nast. But she also writes that it is likely that Payne's widely sold and well-received 1904 biography of Nast, more than anything else, brought Clemens and Payne together. By the way, the two young men who are together here are brothers. On the left is Nicholas. On the right is Alexander. I've had the privilege of teaching them both. Nick in his freshman year, Alexander in his junior year, and in his senior year, he took my writings of Mark Twain course. They're in my dining room because they live up the street, and they take care of my house and watch it when we are away. In New Jersey, as I'm sure in all other states, we all take care of each other and watch each other's backs. And they are Albert Bigelow's pains 
youngest fans. Without this biography, the confident question that was asked by Clemens that all of us wish were directed to us, quote, when would you like to begin, unquote, might not have occurred. In that work, Clemens read how Nast fought political and economic corruption through caricature comparable to the ways he himself sought to critique social behavior and political dishonesty through his prose. He also saw how Payne professionally and intimately preserved the honored image of Nast and so felt confident that Nast would do the same for him. Adding to this area of Twain's studies, I offer for all of you a new and more personal reason for Clemens's selection of pain. He enjoyed the Nast biography because he knew Thomas Nast in friendship and admired his moral beliefs as seen in his political cartoon accomplishments. It is Payne himself who is the lasting personal and biographical connection between Nast and Clemens. Considered the father of the American political cartoon, Thomas Nast is the most famous editorial cartoonist of his time. He served on the staff of Harper's Weekly from 1862 to 1877, and again from 1895 to 1896. His work was highly influential in promoting the political causes he supported. This includes the Union side during the Civil War. President Lincoln was inspired to call him our best recruiting sergeant. After the war, Nast published political cartoons continuously. He gave our country the iconic image of Uncle Sam, the elephant to symbolize the Republican Party, and the donkey to signify the Democratic Party. He also popularized the image of Columbia, quote, the allegorical female embodiment of the United States and the moral conscience of the nation, unquote. More familiarly, he illustrated the well-known figure of Santa Claus and Christmas images throughout his career. Perhaps most importantly, beginning in 1870, Nast had the courage to pursue political reform in New York City by starting and maintaining a campaign against William M. Boss Tweed, who lived from 1823 to 1878, and his Democratic Party Tammany Hall cohorts, who defrauded New York City of tens of millions of dollars through systematic graft and election fraud. Nath's scathing cartoons in Harper's Weekly were instrumental in bringing down the Tweed ring and the imprisonment of Tweed himself. Tweed escaped from prison in December 1875 and fled to Cuba and then to Spain. He was identified through a NAS cartoon in Harper's Weekly, even though those who ID'd him didn't speak English, but they knew NAS cartoons. And so Tweed was arrested in September 1876. He died in prison. He told his cronies, quote, stop them damn pictures. I don't care what the papers write about me. My constituents can't read, but damn it, they can see the pictures, unquote. And a great focus of my words to you tonight are of pictures. In his 1871 piece, The Revised Catechism, Mark Twain directly reflects on Nast's work. First class in modern moral philosophy, stand up and recite what is the chief end of man to get rich. In what way? 
dishonestly if we can, honestly if we must. Who is God, the one only and true? Money is God. Gold and greenbacks and stock, father, son, and the ghost of the same. Three persons in one. These are the true and only God, mighty and supreme. And William Tweed is his prophet. Yet Nas' courage in facing down this corruption came with a price. While he never took the many offered bribes, his concern for his family's safety in New York caused him and his wife in 1872 to move to the crossroads of the American Revolution, Morristown, New Jersey. And there they raised a family in this home that eventually numbered five children. In 1873, Nass toured the nation as a lecturer and sketch artist, making him wealthy. Now, at the lower picture, two other young fans of Albert Bigelow Payne, Brandon on the left, Chris on the right. Again, like Nick and Alexander, I had the privilege and pleasure of having them as freshmen in my Seton Hall Prep English Honors One class. And I had Brandon in junior year American English, American literature, and senior year, he took my Twain course. Alexander has just graduated from college and Nick and Chris and Brandon are now in their junior year. My gosh, how the time flies. So our next source is from Mark Twain's biography. The origin of when Twain and Nast met is from these letters, volume one, published in 1917. Twain was lecturing in New York City's Irving Hall on May 16, 1867. His new fans included the 27-year-old Thomas Nast, who wanted to tour the country with Clemens, with Nast drawing pictures as Mark Twain lectured. But despite what would be lightning sketches by Nast, Clemens just did not have the time, as he was due to sail on the steamship Quaker City, bound for Europe and the Holy Land. And the rest is history. Apparently, the two men tried again to coordinate their schedules. Twain was in Washington, D.C. as a private secretary to Nevada Senator William Stewart from November 1867 to January 1868, when he sent the following thought on the 30th of January, 1868, and published on February 2nd, 1868, in the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise. Thomas Nast, the clever artist of Harper's Weekly, is exhibiting a collection of great caricatures of national subjects in New York and wants me to do the lecturing for his show. I would, if I hadn't so many irons in the fire. I would like it right well for a change, but then changes are risky. I must hunt around for a handsome Pacific coaster to take the berth because I suppose it is personal loveliness Nast is after. Now, it is generally known that Twain fought zealously in trying to protect his works from being pirated. And therefore, it is very interesting and a mark, pun intended, of true friendship that upon being asked by Nast if he could use some of Clemens's sketches for use in a literary series beginning in 1872 called Nast Illustrated Almanac, Twain heartily agreed in his April 4th, 1871 reply. My dear Nast, I like that beef contract article of mine as well as anything I ever wrote. And it is very popular in Washington on account of its satire on clerky airs and official circumlocution. <laughs> I published it in the Galaxy just about a year ago. You will find it in the number for May 1870, I think. 
It is entitled The Facts in the Case of the Great Beef Contract. I am glad your almanac promises so well, and I assure you, I earnestly wish you world of success with it. Yours sincerely, Samuel L. Clemens. Now, Nass gives his reply on April 24th, 1871. My dear Mr. Clemens, the beef contract is very good, but I do not think it is as suitable for my almanac as some of your other things. For I must bear in mind that I cater for the children in my almanac as well as the big folks. So I think that the good little boy who never prospered, or advice to little girls, or the late Benjamin Franklin would suit me better. Therefore, if you will graciously accord me your permission to use any of the foresaid, I shall be happy to avail myself of it. The beef contract would make a good pamphlet, I think, by itself with illustrations, got up like one I send you, the fight in Dame Europa's school. A good many of your other things, too, ought to be illustrated. How does the idea strike you, and upon what terms would you go into such a speculation? Must I see the galaxy proprietors on the subject of the Almanac article? Yours truly, Thomas Nast. Now, Clemens' response is generally, generously enthusiastic. Take any sketch you please, and you are the man to make the selection because you can tell what will illustrate best. And so the result is that the late Benjamin Franklin, first published in the Galaxy magazine in July 1870, appears in Nass Illustrated Almanac 1872. Here's the table of contents, and I would ask everybody to go six lines down, the late Benjamin Franklin by Mark Twain on page 26. And then if you go three, six, seven, eight lines up from the bottom, Advice to Little Girls by Mark Twain. And on a personal note, to be able to hold this almanac at the Morris Township Library's New Jersey History and Genealogy Center, to hold it and know it existed when Mark and Tom were alive is an unparalleled success. Now, According to Dr. R. Kent Rasmussen from his critical companion, let me give as only he can say it. One of America's most accomplished founders, Franklin was a central icon in Clemens's life. As a man who achieved greatness through diligence and hard work, celebrating his success in a classic autobiography, Franklin became a model against whom countless boys measured themselves as they grew up. Few American school children of the early 19th century could have escaped hearing such Franklin homilies as early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise, or a penny saved is a penny earned. But Clemens came, came to regard Franklin as the despoiler of boyhood happiness, summing up his feelings here. On the left are the illustrations that Thomas Nast did. On the right, is the illustration that will appear three years later by True Williams in Twain's work, Sketches New and Old. And let me I call your attention to Twain's words that support these illustrations or the other way around. The subject of this memoir was of a vicious disposition and early prostituted his talents to the invention of maxims and aphorisms calculated to inflict suffering upon the rising generation of all subsequent ages. His simplest acts also were contrived with a view to their being held up for the emulation of boys forever. Boys who might otherwise have been happy. It was in this spirit that he became the son of a soap boiler and probably for no other reason than that the efforts of all future boys who tried to be anything might be looked upon with suspicion unless they were the sons of soap boilers. With a malevolence which is without parallel in history, he would work all day and then sit up nights and let on to be studying algebra the, by the light of a smoldering fire so that all the boys might have to do that also or else have Benjamin Franklin thrown upon them. At the bottom, his maxims were full of animosity toward boys. 
Nowadays, a boy cannot follow out a single natural instinct without tumbling over some of those everlasting aphorisms and hearing from Franklin on the spot. If he buys two cents worth of peanuts, his father says, remember what Franklin has said, my son, a groat, which is a British silver coin worth four pence in old money, a groat a day is a penny a year, and the comfort is all gone out of those peanuts. If he wants to spin his top when he's done work, his father quotes, procrastination is the thief of time. If he does a virtuous action, he never gets anything for it because virtue is its own reward. And that boy is hounded to death and robbed of his natural rest. Because Franklin said once in one of his inspired flights of malignity, early to bed and early to rise, make a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. As if it were any object to a boy to be healthy and wealthy and wise on such terms. The sorrow that that maxim has cost me through my parents experimenting with me in it, tongue cannot tell. The legitimate result is my present state of general debility, indigence, and mental aberration. My parents used to have me up before nine o'clock in the morning sometimes when I was a boy. If they had let me take my natural rest, where would I have been now? Keeping store, no doubt, and respected by all. Franklin was always proud of how he entered Philadelphia for the first time with nothing in the world but two shillings in his pocket and four rolls of bread under his arm. But really, when you come to examine it critically, it was nothing. Anybody could have done it. Now, I am not suggesting that these illustrations are better than what True Williams did but they are more humorously in line with Mark Twain's words. They're different from the only three illustrations that True Williams did that are rather seriously genuine so as to be ironic to Twain's words. Also appearing in the 1872 Almanac is Twain's Advice to Little Girls that was first published in the June 24th, 1865 issue of California's Youth Companion. It is later printed without illustrations in his 1867, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County and other sketches. What is important here is that this particular issue of Youth's Companion, June 24th, 1865, is apparently not extant. So for now, Thomas Nast is the sole illustrator of this sketch. And in a connection today, it's always the relevance of Twain today. His thoughts concerning a typical older sister's dealings with her little brother. I noticed two high school young ladies reading the one page story on my slide presentation and they started giggling. And this is because they each have a younger brother who was a great nuisance. And they loved Twain's gently worded, but very powerful suggestions for quote, correcting unquote, the younger sibling by not throwing mud at him, rather quote, it is better to scold him a little to attain desirable results, unquote. In 1872, Nass had a copy of Roughing It with its flyleaf inscribed by Twain. To Thomas Nast, with the best affections and warm regards of the author, Mark Twain, June 1872. Twain and Nast are also tied in friendship by their respect for President Ulysses S. Grant. Now, here we go. Election of 1872, Republican Ulysses S. Grant running for re-election. Liberal Republican and Democrat Horace Greeley, newspaper editor from New York. Horace Greeley was the founder and editor of the New York Tribune. Now, though he did campaign for liberal reforms, he often took contradictory positions. Sound familiar? that faced the satire of Twain, including his 1868 writing, Private Habits of Horace Greeley, 
for the humor magazine, Spirit of the Times. In 1872, Greeley was nominated to run for president on the liberal Republican ticket against Republican incumbent Grant. But it is Nast who took every chance to satirize Greeley's personal eccentricity and political waywardness in his Harper's Weekly cartoons, conducting a campaign of caricature that was greatly responsible for Grant winning a second term. Now from Payne's 1904 Twain biography, we learn that on December 10th, 1872, Twain writes to Nast, I'd like everyone to go to the bottom paragraph. Nast, you, more than any other man, have won a prodigious victory for Grant. I mean, rather, for civilization and progress. Those pictures were simply marvels. And if any man in the land has a right to hold his head up and be honestly proud of his share in this year's vast events, that man is unquestionably yourself. We all do sincerely honor you and are proud of you. Yours ever, Mark Twain. But there's more. That's the end of the letter. Allow me to digress for just a few seconds. I write letters of recommendation for college-bound students. The entire faculty do it. High school faculty across the country do it. We're right there with Mark Twain because he did the same thing in a very interesting way. Mary Mason Fairbanks was his a friend, was his friend, mentor, confidant, adoptive mother on the steamship Quaker City bound for the Holy Land. In this 1872 letter, Twain enclosed a letter from Mary Mason Fairbanks that refers to Nast. Now, her letter no longer exists, but his letter implies an introduction by him to Nast to help her son Charlie's artistic career. And Twain notes the following. My dear Nast, as the best way of coming at it, I enclose my mother's Fairbanks letter. The last page of it refers it refers to you. We think the whole world of Mrs. Fairbanks, wife of proprietor of Cleveland Herald. She was a pilgrim with me in the Innocents Abroad. Her son Charlie and I have written you, written you about before, and you sent him an autograph from your pencil, which set him up wonderfully. So I think it is a glorious, how I think it is a glorious thing to be a boy's idol, for it is the only worship one can swear to as genuine. And I have no doubt that you feel a good deal as I do about it. Therefore, I send Charlie Fairbanks to you without distrust or fear, satisfied that the few minutes he robs you of will be an inspiration to him and will be transmitted in the works of his hands to the next generation. And just as well satisfied that you will place that loss with little regret along with many another like it, labeled bread cast upon the waters. Within five days, their friendship earns Nas positive response. My dear Mark, I shall be glad to see my young adorer but I am not to be found in New York usually. I only go in once a week to see how things and do all my work at home. Poor deluded boy, he needs but to behold to be completely cured of his infatuation. But send him along, there are trains in and out quite frequently, and I shall receive your young friend as a friend of mine. If you can ever spare the time, I should like to see you out here very much. It is nearly 30 miles from New York and the air is really very fine. I moved here on account of health. I have had catarrh for three years, and this air is highly recommended for such complaints. I hope to see a book from you before long of your English travels. How much I should like to go with you and illustrate it. I think we should have fun, and I might forget to have the catarrh and the blues for a while. The recollections of my European trip 11 years ago give me great pleasure still. 
thanking you for your eulogistic remarks about my work. I remain yours truly, Thomas Nast. Now, while Fairbanks did have early ambitions of becoming an artist, and after finishing his schooling, he began a career in journalism on his father's Cleveland Herald. But the link between Twain and Nast is that Fairbanks developed a lifelong friendship with Nast. He became, to some extent, Nast's protege, lived with him for a time, and collaborated with him in 1892 and 93 on the short-lived Nast Weekly, with Fairbanks writing the text and Nast drawing his pictures. And he named his second son, born in 1879, after him. We have this picture of Thomas Nast of himself and this passage written only by Fairbanks. Mark Twain's wife was a Miss Langdon of Elmira. When Mark first met her, he was not so well known as he is at present. Her father was a judge and doubtless expected family and social importance in his son-in-law. Mark, however, became interested in his daughter and in due time proposed, but was rejected. Well, he said to the lady, I didn't much believe you'd have me, but I thought I'd try. And after a while, he tried again with the same result and then remarked with his monotonous drawl, I think a great deal more of you than if you'd said yes, but it's hard to bear. A third time he met with better luck and then came the most difficult part of his task to address the old gentleman. Judge, he said to the dignified gentleman, have you seen anything going on between Miss Lizzie and me? What, what? exclaimed the judge rather sharply, apparently not understanding the situation, yet getting a glimpse of it from the inquiry. Have you seen anything going on between Miss Lizzie and me? No, sir, I have not, replied the magnet sternly. Well, look sharp and you will, said the author of Innocence Abroad. And that is the way he led up to asking the judicial luminary for his daughter's hand. Obviously not the truth, as we all know, but written by Mr. Fairbanks, courtesy of Mark Twain. Now, Mark Twain writes back, my dear Nast, I thank you heartily for your kindness to me and to my friend, Charlie. The almanac has come and I have enjoyed those pictures with all my soul and body. I wish you could go to England with us in May. Surely you would never regret it. I do hope my publishers can make it pay you to illustrate my English book. Then I should have good pictures. They've got to improve on roughing it. Yours ever, Samuel L. Clemens. But unfortunately, Nass' trip to Europe in the spring of 1873 did not include seeing Twain abroad. Twain abandoned his book that would have been a satire in English manners as he became more involved in what will become the Gilded Age. To this end, Clemens's letter to Elisha Bliss, in pertinent part, says, Friend Bliss, March 4th, 1873. Now, Nast appears to be doing nothing in particular. I want him, solitary and alone, to illustrate this next book, it being an essentially American book, and he will enjoy doing it. Nast only is just one first-class talent, caricature, and no more. Okay. But this book will exercise that talent, I think. I think he will be glad to do this work below his usual terms. If you say so, I will write him. Tell me what you think and tell me about the total amount you think it best to put in the drawing of the illustrations. Unfortunately, it wasn't meant to be. Nass did not contribute any drawings to the Gilded Age. Bliss hired several well-known but presumably less costly artists instead. Now, in 1873, Nast does the illustrations, the story of the good little boy who did not prosper. I have asked my classes, and I include myself, how many of you feel it is so important to have a strong, ironclad, copper riveted set of morals? Everybody's hands go up. How important is it, do you agree, that you must exercise those morals to say and do what is right, even if it means you walk alone. Everybody's hands go up. And my third question is, how many of you are so frustrated by that perfect example all the time, the guy is doing everything right? And everybody's hands go up. 
So the story of the good little boy was first published in the Galaxy magazine in May 1870, but we'll have this longer title, the story of the good little boy who did not prosper. Nast drew 16 illustrations in contrast to just three done by True Williams in 1875 for Mark Twain's sketches, new and old. Now earlier, Nast drew seven illustrations for the late Ben Franklin while Williams only did three. And these are the illustrations True Williams did. Again, I'm not saying, and I would never suggest Thomas Nast are better. It's just a different viewpoint, but it's Thomas Nast and it's True Williams. We can appreciate them both in different ways. In 1874, we have a deception by Mark Twain. This article was originally called A Wicked Deception Perpetuated on Mark Twain in Newark that appeared December 31st, 1868 in Newark's press and it was reprinted here as a deception. And it will be renamed in sketches new and old as how the author was sold in Newark. Interestingly, both Nast and Williams draw only two illustrations apiece for this sketch. But Williams' pictures very closely resemble the earlier ones of Thomas Nast. And true Williams, we must give him credit for creating the image we typically love and enjoy of Mark Twain. He gave us the illustration. He gave us Tom Sawyer. He gave us our hero, our other hero, Huckleberry Finn. And of course, this shows Twain's talents in so many different directions. This is what happens when you try and steal chickens. Now, Twain isn't all amused here, but an amusing fact of sketches new and old is that it originally had one extraction from Jane Stuart Wolsey's 1868 hospital days. And it obviously was not written by Clemens. And its title is From Hospital Days. According to the Mark Twain Project, Clemens transcribed it from that book for some undiscovered purpose, noting the author's name at the top of the page and then crossing it out. He may have inadvertently included his transcription in the printer's copy he submitted to Bliss for sketches new and old. But in his September 22nd and 27th letters to William Dean Howells, he is clearly not happy. I told Bliss to send you advanced sheets of my sketch volume, which I suppose he has done. I saw the first copy yesterday, and about the first thing I ran across was an extract from Hospital Days, page 199, an entirely gratuitous addition by Mr. Bliss to neatly fill out a page. I have ordered it out instanter. Now, he says in November 1875, friend Bliss, didn't you make that correction of the paragraphs smouched from hospital days? Twitchell has an uncorrected copy. According to the Mark Twain project, the initial solution by Bliss was to insert an erratum slip at page 299 of the copies that he had already bound. It reads, quote, by an error of the publishers, the above sketch from Hospital Days was inserted in this book. It should not have been, as Mark Twain is, the, is not the author of it. It will not appear in any future edition, unquote. Now, the scene is set. October 23rd, 1875, Twain sent Nast a cloth-bound copy which had Bliss's notice in place. 
November 9th, 1875, Nast replies, my dear Mark, I have at length received the book which you so affectionately sent me and return heartfelt thanks for the same. It is very track. It is very well go up and makes a very attractive book. Please get on your seatbelts. After I have read it, I will give you the benefit of my valuable judgment upon it. At present, I think that the short piece from Hospital Days is the best thing it contains. And I'm so sorry that the publisher will commit the error of leaving it out next time. Yours truly, Thomas Nast. And so we can all imagine Twain's reaction to receiving that letter. But we all know true friends can get away with this. Our next area is from Mark Twain's Letters, Volume 1. It is bittersweet to recall John Greenleaf Whittier's words, it might have been. Clemens wrote a letter just November 12th, 1877, and the letter echoes the 1867 dual appearance offer that Nast made to him, and he makes a detailed proposition. Follow with me, my dear Nast, I now propose to you what you had proposed to me in November 67, 10 years ago, when I was unknown, that you stand on the platform and make pictures, and I stand by you and blackguard the audience. I should enormously enjoy meandering around to big towns, don't want to go to little ones, with you for company. My idea is not to fatten lecture agents and lyceums on the spoils, but put all the ducats religiously into two equal piles and say to the artist and the lecturer, absorb these. For instance, this being the plan, pay the lecture bureau 2% of the gross receipts to engage halls and arrange dates and route for us. Take an agent with us to 10 door and it shoulder all details at 70 or $75 per week. He to pay his own expenses. Now, I know you and I could pack that hall six nights and two matinees and double that time in a smaller hall. We could clear $3,000 a piece for a Steinway week with no trouble at all. We can pack Music Hall in Boston. It seats near about 2,500, two nights and one matinee or run a week in a smaller hall. Oh, he is all over this. You, you and I can cram any house in America as full as it can hold. I could get up a better concert with a barrel of cats. I am deep in a book, which I can have ready for the printers and the dramatists, for I want to dramatize by the end of January and be ready for you then, if you like the project. Well, you think it over, Nast, and drop me a line. I am not proposing a novelty in business. In California, Nevada, I always ran my own show, took all the risks myself, and pocketed the whole profit. My agent got nothing but a salary. I know this business from A to Z. We should have some fun. Yours truly, Samuel L. Clemens. Again, unfortunately, this was not to be. Nast's response is non-extant. Twain wrote to Mary Mason Fairbanks, February 1878. He did his level best to persuade Nast to make a big lecture tour. He to draw pictures and I to do all the talking he to portray and I to explain. I didn't see why we shouldn't divide $100,000 in 100 nights in these hard times and then retire from public life. But Nast hates the platform, says there is not money enough in the world to hire him to show his face to an audience again. Now, ladies and gentlemen, speaking from personal experience and observation, many Jersey boys can on rare occasion appear foolish in talking inappropriately on a topic. This includes being ready to speak, but neglecting the required work from Speech 101 in knowing their audience to ensure that their prepared remarks will be properly received. Such can be the case with Clemens. Here we have James Greenleaf Whittier. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., Ralph Waldo Emerson, who Artemis Ward once referred to as the vertical coffin, 
Clemens was to speak at James Greenleaf Whittier's 70th birthday banquet. Does this on December 17, 1877. He delivers a Western tale burlesquing Whittier's venerated guests, these three gentlemen, and Whittier himself. If pictures say a thousand words, these distinguished gentlemen look like it would be hard to get them to laugh. <sighs> well, Howells felt the speech was an embarrassing silence of the banquet audience, and it was a disaster. Clemens himself regarded it as a catastrophe. But as I'm sure in other states, but focus here is in the Garden State, in New Jersey, we have a popular saying, I've got your back. Nast apparently did just that because Clemens wrote in February 5th, 1878 to Mrs. Fairbanks. He said, quote, I'm sincerely sorry if it in any way hurt those great poets' feelings. I never wanted to do that, unquote. Nast says it is very much the best speech and most humorous situation I have ever contrived. And as my dad would say, no further discussion. Mr. Victor Fisher, former principal editor at the Mark Twain Project, recently uncovered what is apparently the only known set of sketches done on the same page by Nast and Clemens. The first in purple ink is of a sleeping cat by Clemens captioned by him as the cat, a cat. The second is a black inked, obviously drawn cat by Nast, but he humorously calls it a dog. Dated from Hartford in November 1877, Twain's handwriting says, if by we, Mr. Warner means Hartford generally, it would have better become him to speak for himself alone and not wantonly hurt the feelings of such of us as can draw and paint, Samuel L. Clemens. According to Mr. Fisher, they now know it was from an autograph book which Charles Dudley Warner had signed earlier with some remark about writers not being able to draw. And we, Michael Frank and I, are planning to include it in Mark Twain's letters, volume 7, 1876-1877. Everybody buy a copy because I sure am. Now, I'm sure you're all looking at this and saying, what is this? Well, for me, and for my Jersey friends, there are two colloquialisms used for when we have control over a situation. I've so got this. I'm all over this. Perhaps Mark Twain himself would appreciate these confident beliefs in our abilities through his irascible temper that has been documented, documented in many ways. See, one particular event occurred in late 1881. He thought that the New York Tribune's editor-in-chief, Whitelaw Reed, was, quote, regularly slandering him in his newspaper. Infuriated, he was determined to write a sensational biography of Reed that would ruin him, unquote. But there's more. While he gathered material for the book, he decided Nast would illustrate it. Fortunately, Clemens listened to his better half, his gravity, Olivia, his dear wife, who suggested, through common sense, that he find out first if any of the rumors were true. They were not. So Reed's biographical work was discarded. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, for this occurrence, Clemens was all over this. As he said, don't argue with somebody who buys ink by the barrel. In 1903, Clemens remarked, only one thing is impossible with God, to find any sense in any copyright law on the planet, unquote. Dr. R. Kent Rasmussen notes, quote, the absence of effective international copyright laws allowed Canadian publishers to prey on Clemens's early books. And to fight this problem, he spent several weeks in Montreal in November, December, 1881 with James Osgood in order to meet a residency requirement to protect his prints and the pauper copyright. But spending only two weeks in Montreal and Quebec City hotels 
weren't enough to gain the required protection on the Prince and the Pauper by simply being on Canadian soil on December 1st, the day the British edition of the novel was issued by Chatto and Windus. The relation by his friend Nast is that the January 21st, 1882 issue of Harper's Weekly displays Nast's drawing entitled Innocence Abroad in Search of a Copyright. It shows Clemens setting his toe on Canadian soil with a copy of The Prince and the Pauper under his arm against the backdrop of agricultural signs of authors being green or small potatoes, thus poking gentle humor at authors and, of course, Clemens, who are so naive to think they can get the necessary copyright protection from the unusually titled Canadian Department of Agriculture and Arts. His cartoon was founded on the odd clause in the Canadian Copyright Act, which provides that authors, authors shall register their works in the office of the Minister of Agriculture. From November 1884 to February 1885, Clemens and George W. Cable gave a reading and lecture tour through the East and Midwest. On November 21st, 1884, Morris Towns newspaper, The Jerseyman, advertised humor and pathos readings by Clemens and Cable on November 27, 1884 at Morristown's Lyceum Hall. Here's the original newspaper. November 21st, 1884. Here's the advertisement. Humor and pathos readings by Mark Twain, Samuel L. Clemens, and George W. Cable from their own writings at Lyceum Hall, Thanksgiving evening, evening November 27th at 8 o'clock. Admission 75 cents. Reserve seats $1. The board had chosen his three holes. Forget all that. That's not important. What's important is right below it. Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer's comrade by Mark Twain, with fine heliotype of the author, 175 illustrations, agents, splendid terms, canvassing books ready, Charles L. Webster and Company, 658 Broadway, New York, and it will be coming out in just a few months. Well, Thomas Nast writes to Mark Twain, and he says, my dear Mr. Clemens, seeing that you are to appear here on Thanksgiving evening, I write to ask you to allow us the pleasure of entertaining you and Mr. Cable. We dine at two o'clock and should like to have you come out in the noon train and share that frugal meal with a hungry family and amuse yourselves as you as may seem best in the afternoon. Or if you cannot spend so much time here, we can give you a substantial tea at six or seven. Do you require reinforcing after the lecture is over? That was always my hungry time. I asked beforehand because in a town like this, you can't get anything on a holiday after 10 o'clock in the morning. Hoping that no previous engagement may deprive us of the pleasure of seeing you here, I remain yours very truly, Thomas Nast. Our next section is from Payne's biography. So Mark Twain wasn't going to pass up a Thanksgiving dinner. So that afternoon, they had their supper. Oysters on the shell were served at this gathering. And Mr. Clemens, according to Payne, expressed his delight at the quality. Won't you have some more? suggested Nast. Don't care if I do, assented Clemens in his deliberate way. So another serving was brought and approved of at the finish. Have another, said Nast. Come to think of it, I believe I will, draw Clemens. Another plate was served. And another and another. At the end of the fifth plate of oysters, Twain called a halt. Look here, Nast, he said sorrowfully. I didn't know you had an oyster, oyster ranch in your cellar. I guess I'll let this job out. And then he noticed apples that the children and Mrs. Nast were eating, and he added, are there any more apples in this house? Because if there is, I'd like one. This is the Mark Twain home in Hartford. I urge everyone to visit it and study it if you haven't done so already and keep going back. It is magnificent. But we must always remember it was his home. 
a home, and the word never had so much meaning before. And he had his family. He had everything he could want. And so we have Thomas Nast's home. And Thomas Nast has his family. And this is what Thomas Nast's home looks like today. <clears throat> and it encapsulates Twain's words. To us, our house had a heart and a soul and eyes to see us with and approvals and solicitudes and deep sympathies. It was of us and we were in its confidence and lived in its grace and in the peace of its benediction. Unless, of course, you have Mark Twain as your house guest. It won't be boring and anything is possible. Now, here is what happened. Mark Twain had to get up the next day and Mrs. Nass said, don't worry, I'll make sure you get up so you both can catch your train. This shows Clemens dressed for sleep, placing a grandfather's clock next to six mantel or desk clocks. On top of the small staircase is Cable, is, I apologize, Nast with a candle discovering Clemens in front of the staircase's bottom. This may not be an exaggeration because it's based on truth. And Twain knows that truth is our most valuable commodity and we're not gonna economize on it this time. According to Payne, Clemens and Cable had to leave the next morning. But upon Mrs. Nass awakening, she is suspicious of a strange silence in the house. She finds the servants sound asleep with the back hall alarm clock stopped at about the hour that the guests retired. The picture has all the clocks showing 11 p.m. The truth is that Clemens silenced every clock in Nass home. On being accused of duplicity, he said, Wall, not well, Wall, because he's from Hannibal, those clocks are all overworked anyway. They will feel much better for a night's rest. The home of Thomas Nass still stands today across the street from McCulloch Hall Historical Museum that has the largest collection of original Nass drawings in the United States. I urge everybody to go visit it. His home is officially known as La Fontana, and though it's privately owned, there's always been speculation about which room was used by Mark Twain on that Thanksgiving night so many years ago. Well, thanks to the Mark Twain Project and Dixon Wexer's The Love Letters of Mark Twain, there is a letter from Clemens to Olivia dated November 28, 1884. We dined and stayed all night with Tom Nast and family and had a noble good time. I occupied his eldest daughter's room, Miss Julia Nast, aged about 20, the most remarkable room I was ever in, a curious and inexhaustible museum. Not an inch of the four walls could be seen, all hidden under pictures, photographs, etchings, photographs, Christmas cards, menus, fans, statuettes, trinkets, and knickknacks in all metals, little brackets everywhere with all imaginable dainty and pretty things massed upon them and hanging from them. The most astounding variety of inexpensive and interesting trifles that was ever huddled together upon four walls in this world. It took me an hour to undress and another hour to dress because my eyes were so busy and the new surprises were so constant and so engaging. She asked me this morning to give her name, or her, give her a name for her room and I told her to call it says Nola's despair. I would like to see Susie's room decorated in that way. The thing is easy and occupies years. Whenever you get hold of a new trifle, nail it to the wall with a pin. At a rough guess, I should say there are 3,000 pretty trifles in Julia Nass's room. They didn't cost more than 3,000 dimes, perhaps, but they are worth 20 times the money to look at. This is very poignant in our eyes and hearts when he says, it would take years. And I would like to see Susie's room decorated that way because we all know that Susie tragically had less than 12 years to live when he sent this letter. He sent this letter to Thomas Nast. My dear Nast, all these days I've been feeling the thanks I owe you and your family for a thoroughly enjoyable night and for a hospitality which neither oppressed nor made afraid. And if I haven't voiced these thanks before, it is only because we have been kept too busy by the platform and the railroad. 
Be piously grateful that as yet you are permitted to remain with your household and under the shelter of your delightful home. And do all your praying now, for a time is coming when you will have to go railroading and platforming. And then you will find you cannot pray anymore because you will have only just enough time, only just time and to swear enough. Please remember me gratefully to Mrs. Nast and all the scions of your house and also to their sire. And believe me, truly yours, S.L. Clemens. As Payne said, he had been my literary idol from childhood, and he has been of so many others. More than that, for the personality in his work had made him nothing less than a hero to his readers, then and now and forever. When we think of friends and call their, their faces out of the shadows and their voices out of the echoes that faint across the corridors of memory and do it without knowing why, save that we love to do it. We content ourselves that that friendship is a reality and not a fancy, that it is builded upon by a rock and not upon the sands that dissolve away with the ebbing tides and carry their monuments with them. Mark Twain and his friendship with Albert Bigelow Payne and also his very special friendship with Thomas Nast. That was so wonderful, John. Thank you so much for enlightening us all. We do have a number of questions. Um, so we'll try to get through a few of them quickly. Um, the first one um, is, of course, is that your I don't give a damn suit? Oh, uh, this <laughs> is a jacket I purchased for myself. And I have yet to wear it at Seton Hall Preparatory School because I'm just too shy. And I also think no one can wear a white suit except Mark Twain himself. <laughs> so I'm, I'm too shy to wear it outside. I'll just wear the jacket to class. It, it spoofs up the face. I get it. I get it. All right. So to a more serious question, uh, what is your favorite Twainism? Can you use it in a sentence? How should you live your life? Good books, good friends, and a sleepy conscience. That's all you need for success in life. Great. I think that came from the same person who you taught um, the word uh, flat noodle to. That's Jeremy Lederman. Okay. So that might be what he was getting at there. Um, so next question is, being a Jersey boy, are you aware of any comments by Springsteen about Twain? I imagine they would appreciate each other's work. I don't know if Springsteen made any remarks about Twain, but I think that's a great topic for future study, and I thank the person, and that person will get credit if I do find connections that Springsteen made about Twain. Great. Um, so this question seems to have asked, answered itself, but uh, the question was, uh, did uh, Payne write a bio about Nast? Um, and then it says, Thomas Nast, his period and his pictures was found on Amazon. So is that the yes. correct book to look that, for? Yes, Thomas, uh, excuse me, Albert Bigelow Payne wrote the biography of Thomas Nast and it came out in 1904 and thank God Twain had a copy and Twain admired the job he did. But Twain and Nast were also friends. So Twain and, and Payne actually interviewed Nast, uh, Twain for, quest, for information that would go into the Nast biography. So they're all tied together. Awesome. Um, are you in touch with any of Nast's descendants? I had spoken with the representatives of McCulloch Hall Museum. I am not and they don't believe there are any more living descendants of Nass, unfortunately. Happens to the best of them, as we well know in the Twain world. <laughs> um, uh, so the next question is, has the estate copyrighted all the book illustrations? Do you know what the copyright status on them is? Can you say the question again, please? Has the estate copyrighted all of the book's illustrations? Not to my knowledge. That's why I was free to use the illustrations. We made sure of that before I put this together years ago. Yeah. And our last question at the moment. So if anybody has any more, put them in there. But 
It says, in what 1961 TV show was Mark Twain featured as a depressed father after losing his son, only to be re-inspired by another young admirer? Hint, the young boy was named Mark. I was I was only three years old at the time, and my bedtime was at 7.30. <laughs> I want to say The Rifleman, but I could be wrong. I don't know the answer either, because I wasn't even thought of in 1961. So <laughs> There was an there was oh. article that Dr. Shelley Fisher Fishkin did on Mark Twain uh, on television, and the answer might be in that article, because he was portrayed as an adult on the television show Bonanza, three times and he uh uh in the other western of the mid 1960s the big valley we see one of the main characters being given a blue covered cloth book by his mother played by barbara stanwick and he reads the celebrated jumping frog of calaveras county by mark twain anybody who watches that should start cheering so uh, Neil in the comments says the rifleman, and I just put it into Google, and they also say the rifleman. So you were correct. <laughs> First. So um, I did ask them to test your knowledge, and so we we did that well, I guess. Um, so that is all the questions that was in the ask a question feature. Um, it was such a wonderful uh, program. I will say that uh, we are hoping to get some uh, Thomas Nast illustrations of Santa Claus on display hopefully either this winter or next winter. So everybody keep an eye out uh, on our website for the announcement of that exhibit when I get it all together. Um, we do have one more question that just came in. Um, can you talk about the research that went into this presentation? Oh yes, I went to McCulloch Hall the Historical Museum and I spoke with its chief curator, Ryan Hyman, and I had said to him, what is the connection between Thomas Nast and Mark Twain, and he had said, Twain loaned or gave Nast three of his sketches to be in Nast's Almanac. And if you walk right down the street to Morristown Public Library's North Jersey History and Genealogy Center, they have them. And I never even saw this connection until uh, Dr. Terry Ogle mentioned it four years ago. He said Thomas Nast and Mark Twain were friends and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I remember when I was eight years old and being taken to Morristown to spend Thanksgiving with my uncle, my aunt and my mother, in order to let the turkey simmer, took me and my cousins on a tour of Morristown. And my mother said, that's the Thomas Nast house. And I said, okay. And my aunt said, I think Mark Twain spent the night there. And that was at the moment that I had taken my brother's copy of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, turned to the cave scene and got immediately hooked. Now he got married in Possessions Nine Tenths of the Law, so now it's my book. <laughs> but I hadn't recalled that memory till Dr. Ogle started talking about Thomas Nast and Mark Twain saying they knew each other. And I said, Nast, Morristown, bad home. And I went right to McCulloch Hall and right to, um, Genealogy Center, and of course, also conferring with Kent Rasmussen, Kevin McDonald, Dr. Wong, Dr. Cribben, and talking um, with Dr. Terry Ogle. So it's, as my parents say, it's a team effort. Yeah. That? That's okay. As long as it <laughs> was not your fault. I'm going to blame the cat um, that just walked across my keyboard. And um, thank you so much for, for answering that last question. Um, no others have come in. So um, I do, again, just want to thank you so much, John, for, for coming and being one of our travel speakers again. And right. it was it was so great to chat with you. I do want to point everybody in the audience to our um, event page. I'll put a link into it. Uh, to it into the chat 
um, here in a, just a second. But we have so many great events um, happening virtually um, every week, uh, lots of author talks. Um, I also want to point out our newest series. It's called uh, Clemens Conversations. These are more Twain focused. Um, basically, it, it's a discussion more than a lecture. Um, the next one is on July 7th at 3 p.m. They're held on Zoom, so you can interact with um, Aaron, who's giving it. Um, July 7th, will, it'll be on the adventures of Huckleberry Finn and uh, they're happening throughout the summer. So definitely check out our events page for everything that's happening. Support us if you can, donate here, buy a t-shirt to match John, buy a book, come visit us. The house is open for tours um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you everybody and good night. Thank you so much.